good evening everyone and welcome to science gallery bengaluru's uh, first fully online digital exhibition season contagion that explores the transmission of diseases emotions and behaviors uh, we are very glad that all of you can join us today evening for our lecture in the public lecture series by chinmay tumbai titled the age of pandemics 1817 to 1920 how they shaped india and the world Today's lecture is a part of our 22 lecture series supported by the Indian National Science Academy. Before I introduce Chinmay to all of you, I'd like to briefly let you know about the upcoming programs. Uh, do join us tomorrow for a lecture by journalist and public health expert Thomas Abraham, an early warning: the story of SARS in 2003. That's tomorrow at 6:30 p.m. the same time as today's lecture. uh we also have coming up next week two very interesting events a panel discussion with academic advisor for contagion sanjay bhattacharya historian of medicine along with sai abimbola and sharifa sekalala who will talk about human rights and knowledge during crises this is next friday 11 june at 2 pm we also have a master class by basi stitkin a german artist whose work fluid dialogues is being shown at contagion his master class matter out of place will deal with blood uh, so please do join in for that as well now to introduce to you our speaker for today chinmay tumbe he is a faculty member in the economics area of the indian institute of management ahmedabad an economist by training he has worked in academic corporate and government institutions in india uk italy on topics related with migration labor markets urbanization macroeconomics and economic history He is the author of India Moving: A History of Migration, and his newest book is The Age of Pandemics, eighteen seventeen to nineteen twenty: How They Shaped India and the World. And this is what he will be talking about today. Uh, I'd like to remind everyone in the audience that you could please type your questions in the Q and A box. We will have a Q and A session at the end of the lecture. and we'd also encourage you to please fill out the feedback form that is shared in the chat box it's always great to get to know your response to the lecture and how we might do better going forward in all our programs uh without further ado i'd like to hand over to chinmay for today evening's lecture thank you hi thanks for this kind invitation can you hear me right so today i'm going to talk about my book it's called the age of pandemics uh covering a period from 1817 to 1920 and uh i got into you know excited about researching this topic uh last year uh in uh, in in march 2020 when the who announced the covid pandemic uh when it struck me that i had in a duertently you know uh, collected a lot of information on past pandemics when i was working on migration so my first book was on migration but while you research migration history you often come across you know episodes in the past where people moved and one of the reasons often people would escape especially cities was during pandemics so i was already exposed to many of these pandemics which i'm going to talk about today cholera plague influenza and so on uh, and the other reason why you know i was really interested to write this was this was such a devastating period you know 1817 to 1920 where a lot of people died millions of people died uh the worst affected country was india and yet surprisingly last year you know when the who announced this as a pandemic very few people were even aware that india had gone through such a calamity so this book is attempting to kind of revive the collective memory of uh, india in particular but this is a book not just on india uh and kind of arguing as to what were the kind of causes and consequences of those pandemics how did people respond back then and above all are there actually things we can learn from history uh, we say that history does not you know repeat itself but history can often rhyme and so what is it from history that we can learn especially as we go through covid today right so what I'm, the way i'm going to do this talk in the next 40 minutes is to look at the three pandemics cholera plague and influenza sequentially and then i'm going to lead it up to a discussion about how what or what is it that we learn from those pandemics uh, in the way we been tackling covid so far so i am not a scientist i am trained as an economist i work on economics history demography 
I'm not going to go into scientific details. I'm going to look at pandemic as an episode. And I'm interested in how this episode unfolds time and time over, over again. And obviously, all of us have just been through the worst, the most devastating pandemic that has hit India since 1918. Uh, and it's just been literally a few weeks since that wholesale devastation happened. And so obviously, this is very fresh in the memory of a lot of people. And I'd be happy to take questions that you might have on this. So let me start by pointing out some of the things we saw in this pandemic and what history can tell us uh, right there. Uh, last year, during the first wave, we went in for a national lockdown. And one of the casualties or the fallouts of that was that we got a migration crisis. Now, it's instructive because uh, the migration crisis saw you know, these heart-wrenching visuals of people leaving our cities and so on. But I'm going to show you this other picture, which is also one of migrants leaving cities, except that it's more than 100 years back. It's taken in 1897, where people are leaving the city of Bombay uh, due to the plague. Right? So two pictures, uh, kind of you know, more than 100 years apart. But if you see the expressions of the people, one is a photograph, one is an illustration. You, know, you look at the child on this person's uh, back and the child on the woman's hand on the other picture, you'll see there's a similar sense of desperation, right? that the migrants want to leave. Of course, what you see on the left is a train. And of course, uh, we, since our national lockdown was very stringent last year, we shut down the trains with the four-hour notice period. And that's why the, the migrants had to walk back. Now, the reason I'm starting off you know, out here is that suppose policymakers actually knew this picture in the left that you're seeing, would they have then you know, behave, uh, acted differently last year before announcing the lockdown? Right. And obviously, the answer, I think, would be very different because we've seen what's happened this year. This year, we've not had a migration crisis like we had last year, precisely because the trains were kept. Cross-border transport options were not dramatically shut down as they were done last year. So interestingly, the British, while they had, you know, they, they messed up on various other fronts, on this particular issue of should we shut down the trains or not, they took this view during the plague that maybe we should arrange special trains to transport migrant workers back home because if we don't and if we just shut down the trains, they will anyway walk back home. You know, this inevitability of people going back home because their incomes dry up, the economic security vanishes, was very stark. And that's exactly what the Indian government did last year. We started the Shramik train, some of you remember, but this happened two months late. And in, those, in that time, we got a, in my view, needless migration crisis. So this is a classic example of you know, how history matters to understand a particular episode because pandemic management requires a lot of very hard policy trade-offs to be made. This big debate of you know, lives versus livelihoods, uh, how much to lock down, should we shut down transport systems? There, there are very, very hard policy choices to be made. And that is why history is very important to inform some of these decisions. The second, you know, uh, learning, which clearly I think uh, one, one takes from the past is, about, uh, is the simple thing that pandemics rarely get over in a few months and pandemics come in waves. Whether it was the cholera, you know, plague or, or the influenza pandemics that we are going to talk about, they, come, they came in waves. And this is a chart from the work of Siddharth Chandra and others, which looks at the excess mortality uh, statistics uh, of the first wave and the second wave of the 1918 influenza. And if any of you have seen the COVID cases for India this year, you'll see that they're actually quite similar in the sense that the first wave now on hindsight seems very mild compared to what we've been through in the last two months. Right? And this kind of picture, which is you know, using data from more than 100 years back, kind of tells you that you know, when somebody tells you that, oh, we could not have anticipated a second wave, one has to be careful in you know, looking at that because again, it's all there in the history. The history tells you about how devastating waves of pandemics can be, right? And so in this particular case, this was India's worst demographic shock on record when nearly 20 million people died. Right? And so again, if a policymaker had seen this chart, you know, any time in the last year, uh, and they should have, they should have known. And of course, there are very good successful examples of district offices in India who actually were looking at not history, but looking at other countries' experiences and preparing in advance. 
to think of you know dr rajendra bharud district magistrate of nandurbar district in maharashtra who was building up these oxygen plants in anticipation of the second wave way back in september last year so while everyone else was winding down you know those temporary makeshift hospitals winding down medical facilities there were some officers tuned in to what was going around right and arguably if this kind of a memory of past pandemics was much more alive we would have been much more better prepared to face this particular wave which arrived uh, uh, in the last few months so with that as an introduction i'm going to you know jump now into what i'm trying to do in this book uh, the age of pandemics there are two main arguments in this book one is that the age of pandemics is a huge part of global history you know so if any of you you know been aware of what kind of history we learn about this period in our textbooks for example it is classically about the rise and fall of british rule you know this is a this is a huge political history narrative that is brought about whether it's globalization imperialism nationalism and so on but an important thing that happened in this period is that asia's share of global population falls from around 65% to 50% now that's a huge demographic shock that asia receives and within asia india is the number one hit now if you've never heard of this period before as a pandemic period it's precisely because a lot of global history is written from a european centric view and it's precisely because europe was not that badly hit by those pandemics that we don't hear much about so you might have heard of something called as a black death which is a 14th century plague but that hit europe so that is well you know entrenched in european history but because these were pandemics which hit asia you know they somehow dropped off the historical radar so what i'm trying to do in this book is to bring back the significance of this period from the view of pandemics and the second reason as i just pointed out is that there's a huge value in remembering these pandemics for india in particular because india was the most affected country in all those three episodes and so you know there are tremendous lessons to be learned from the past so to in a nutshell you know a, a lot of this research that's gone into the book is statistical in nature i collected a mortality statistical database at the province level in india uh you know from about 1870 where the first death statistics in india start over 1940 uh and you know using various other sources and so on i have kind of built this table and for those who are really interested there's not only a book but there's a supplement to the book which is freely available online and it's called pandemics and historical mortality in india uh that provides the statistics a bibliography and this is freely available right so all these all the numbers i'm going to show you are coming from uh, uh this uh, uh particular working thing now cholera was a century long pandemic it of course was, did not come every year in the same intensity plague was a 25 year pandemic which really knocked out india for a long time and influenza literally hit india in the span of a few months but globally it lasted for about two and a half to three years right so three different pandemics influenza was the most deadly right so to give you a sense of how dangerous these diseases were you know covid today has a reported case fatality rate of something like you know 1 to 2% which means you know about 100 people who report those cases about one or two two died now for cholera in the 19th century that number was more than 50% for plague it was something like 80% and for influenza it was much lower about you know less than uh, 10% in general but it was much more virulent right? so it the transmission of that virus was much more cholera and plague were bacteria based that is why the development of antibiotics in the 20th century did a you know good deal to counter those diseases whereas influenza is a virus so coronavirus if you want to compare with these three is much closer to influenza because it's a virus and not a bacteria but there are important if you look at them as events and episodes there are important things to learn from each of those uh, you know three episodes and again if you see the numbers you'll see that over 70 million people died this is a number more than all the people who died of say the two world wars in the 20th century imagine learning history without learning the history of the world wars but what we are saying is that the age of pandemic killed about the same number of people and yet we are not you know we don't learn anything in our history textbooks about the age of pandemics and india was the worst affected region 40 million of those you know 70 million odd people who died were in india and you'll see that for plague it was almost entirely influenza also big and cholera also So I'll start the story with cholera. Uh, cholera broke out. Cholera was all, all, you know, there throughout history. 1817, there's a very virulent strain which breaks out in eastern India, and you'll see that this is an age where there are no railways, no steamboats, 
it takes a lot of time. It takes about one and a half years to go from Eastern India, say Calcutta, where it hits in August 1817, all the way to Ceylon or Sri Lanka, where it reaches in January 1819. It's almost one and a half years to go from Eastern India to Southern India. I'll come to this point of how does it move from place to place, but I'll just give you the context. That this is a period in which a famous Anglo-Maratha war is fought, and a lot of that troop movement contributed, people say, towards the, the transmission of this disease. So you'll see this is a map which shows, you know, when did it arrive at a particular place first, and give you a sense of how it was moving across the subcontinent back then. What was cholera as a disease? Cholera basically led to a lot of dehydration, uh, you often turn blue in color, uh, sunken eyes. It, death could be very terrifyingly quick. You, the minute you got it and you could die within four hours sometimes. This is a picture which shows you, you know, how a person could look if a person had cholera. And because it was dehydration, the eventual cure against cholera, which was discovered in the late 20th century, more than 100 years after the viral strain broke out, was basically rehydration, or what is now known as oral rehydration therapy. When cholera broke out from India, it started moving across the world, and especially Europe. And Europe really did not know what to do with it. I should just stress here that at this time, medical knowledge was pretty much uniform across the world in terms of its effectiveness, which means that in the early 19th century, there was no real advantage which was accrued to, say, what we now call as Western medical systems. If you compare the British medical knowledge in India at that time, versus the Ayurvedic practices, the Unani practices. There weren't real you know, uh, differences. And the British soldiers would die in pretty much the same propensities as the Indian soldiers to epidemics and diseases. Right? So this is an important period in which scientific knowledge is basically saying diseases are spread by air. Diseases are spread by something called the miasma theory. That is impure air caused by the rotting of bodies and so on releases something in the air and that causes diseases. And this is a kind of a philosophical you know, approach towards what causes epidemics in the first place. Right? And we now know that cholera is actually a waterborne disease. Right? And so you can imagine how this shift happened over the 19th century. It required a completely different way of understanding disease transmission. That is why we say cholera is the first you know, disease. The, the attention that cholera received really led to major medical breakthroughs in the late 19th century with which we still benefit today. So in this period, the life expectancy rate in India, for example, was only 20 years. If you were born in India in this time period, 19th century, you could expect to live only about 20 years. You know, that's really small. Today, you can expect to live almost 70 years. And that's because of the medical and you know, technology advancements that's happened in the last 100 years. But a lot of that started with people looking at how do we stop cholera, especially in Europe. So when it st first started breaking out, this kind of picture shows you, a lot of people thought that all this advice against on cholera is useless. We really don't know what is cholera uh, at that point. You know, cholera also crosses the Atlantic. It goes to North America. It devastates the Ameri USA. An American president dies because of cholera, uh, though not while in office, you know, a few months after the person had left office. In all these places, remember, cholera was not just called cholera. It was called Indian cholera, right? Just as many people now call the virus as a Chinese virus. But you'll see that the WHO today does not attribute names specifically to diseases because it's very tough to determine the outbreak of a particular disease. Right? And so we now know that not all of the cholera must have started in Eastern India. It could have become endemic in many, many places. So there's a lot of revision of this view that it was actually some sort of an Indian cholera. Right? But you'll see that there's a disease, there's some science behind it, but a lot of it then becomes a political narrative. Right? And so cholera no longer was just cholera in the 19th century, it became Indian cholera, which means Indians were also subjected to discrimination, right? because it was Indians were seen to harbor or generate cholera, uh, and cholera became a major you know, global issue. Right? So just like how COVID and, and, and uh, uh, the, the Chinese, a lot of Chinese migrants in the US got attacked and so on, similar things that we've observed in the time of cholera. Uh, this is a, a, a cartoon which shows you know, how, how rents would come down because people would flee cities in the US. US was hit big time in 1832, 49, and 66. The country most affected by cholera is India in terms of deaths, but it, as a percentage of population, it was actually Egypt. And this is a picture which tells you, you know, about how 
devastating it was for Egypt. Uh, this is a picture from 1883, but it tells you about the people returning from a funeral, a uh, very sad and tragic scene. Uh, cholera, this is a scene from Russia. Russia was also hugely affected. The famous music composer Tchaikovsky died due to cholera, and so did his mother, actually. Uh, the, one of the things that cholera, the legacy of cholera, was that it you know, really gave a huge impetus to quarantine systems. Back then, nobody used the word lockdown. But quarantine was, in a way, the equivalent of what we would call as a lockdown. And just like today, we have this lives versus livelihood debate. There was a you know, very big debate back then as well about do quarantines work or not? Are diseases truly contagious from human to human spread? Or is it because of the air, water? Huge debates at that time. This is a still from, again, Russia uh, of a quarantine system. And you can see in this image of you know, the social distancing kind of a view of people practicing. So people are clueless about how the disease actually works, but there are some hypotheses, and you know, people are working along with that. Now, the big breakthrough on cholera was understanding transmission. In fact, you cannot really end a pandemic systematically without understanding its transmission. Right? And so uh, the person who really discovered this was John Snow uh, in, in England in 1850s. But remarkably, you know, he showed that cholera is actually waterborne, it's not airborne. But despite that, the British medical officers in India for the next 40 or 50 years dismissed the waterborne theory and maintained the airborne theory, arguably costing the lives of millions of Indians. Right? Now, this is an example of you know, a very clever piece of research done by a British medical officer in India, a bureaucrat, who was convinced that Jon Snow was right. We now know he was, that cholera is waterborne. And you know, he showed in his book called uh, uh, Cholera and Water in India in 1887, a, a village level map in South India showing where people of a particular caste used to live on one side of the street, people of another set of castes lived on the other side. And in this particular village, only the so-called high castes got contaminated or rather got affected by cholera because they would drink waters from the wells named A and B on this map. Whereas the uh, people living on the other street and because in India, the caste level segregation is so strong at the residence level and the water source is so strong, he basically found that nobody on the other side actually contracted cholera. And now the one person who did happened to be the washerman who would go over to this other side and you know, uh, uh, interact with the people uh, where the wells marked A and B. Right. So it's an interesting uh, way of looking at how to uh, understand disease transmission. John Snow had famously done an experiment uh, and used maps in London. Uh, this is an example of, again, how social, socially kind of social divisions uh, can yield sometimes interesting inferences in the world of epidemiology. So cholera was soon to, known to be waterborne. Uh, and then came the vaccines. Right? And the person you're seeing in this chart is a person called Valdemar Hafkin, who comes to India to test out his cholera vaccines. So this is a time period in the late 19th century where suddenly bacteriology is coming into the fore. Uh, and you know people like Robert Koch, Louis Pasteur, kind of household names today in the world of science, these were great scientists who were making terrific inventions. And you know, Hafkin was trained at the Pasteur Institute, uh, uh, or rather he was working there. And he came to India to test out his cholera vaccines. In a sense, he had to stay back in India for almost 20 more years because then he got dragged into the plague pandemic. And then he had to, you know, he was developing the plague vaccines. But the, the legacy of this is that today in Bombay and for Mumbai, you have a, something called as the Hafkin Institute. And in a few months from now, they are also going to be producing vaccines for COVID, right? or rather against COVID. So Haskin is a hugely important person in this whole uh, scenario. And I should add that we would not actually have the Serum Institute of India if Haskin never came to India. You know? So uh, uh, it's because of the Haskin Institute that the Punawalas who run the Serum Institute, who are horse breeders, they kind of started interacting with the Haskin Institute in Mumbai in the uh, 1960s uh, to protect their horses. And that's really how they got the idea of getting to vaccine manufacture. Right? So it's, a, it's an interesting way to see part dependency that if Hafkin had not come to India, it's quite likely that the Punawalas would not, never have kind of got into the vaccine business and you would not actually have had a Serum Institute. And I should say, just like Serum Institute is like today, you know, the, the star vaccine producer of India, Hafkin Institute soon became that uh, in the early 20th century, where, you know, the plague vaccine was hugely in demand uh, around. So this is a picture showing you vaccination. There was a lot of vaccine hesitancy back then as it is uh, now. Uh, but interestingly, you know, a lot of public communication 
uh, uh, was tried out back then to overcome vaccine hesitancy was certainly existed. Now, how did the cholera pandemic really end? Right. Uh, the end of this pandemic really happened through what we call as prevention and cure. Right? That is on both counts, it became easier to prevent cholera because once they understood that it's waterborne, what governments around the world started doing, not in India for a long time, but in Europe and North America, is invest in clean water systems. And so cities where cholera was very rampant in the West suddenly started offering clean drinking water by investing hugely in water purification systems. And similarly, uh, you, you had uh, a huge developments in cures. Uh, these four you know, people that you're seeing on your screen right now are very important. John Snow, in, in terms of identifying waterborne transmission. Robert Koch identified cholera bacteria. Leonard Rogers, who was an officer with the Indian Medical Service, uh, cut down the case fatality rate substantially. He developed the intravenous treatment of, of, of you know, uh, 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 cholera, uh, IV treatments. And then later, Sambuna Day, an Indian scientist uh, uh, working in Calcutta, uh, discovered really exactly how cholera attacks the human body. Uh, and, you know, it was a path-breaking uh, stuff that he did. And it's actually thanks to him that we now have good, not only vaccines, but good, simple, cost-effective cures for cholera. And so, in a way, that's how the cholera pandemic has gone away today, by focusing on, not through vaccination, but focusing on prevention and cure. Right? And so, cholera is no longer, we say, a deadly disease, because we know how to deal with it. But for the 100 years during the age of pandemics, it was quite a deadly disease and it killed you know, tens of millions of people around the world. Uh, now I'll move on to plague now. Plague you know, is a disease which has tormented humanity throughout history. It is the most terrifying disease, which is because for, unlike cholera or influenza, it would leave its you know, marks on your body, just like smallpox. It would leave bubonic plague, for example, would leave those buboes marks on your you know, armpits or groins. Uh, and it was it was a very terrifying disease, and the case fatality rates were much higher. It was about eighty percent, which means if you got plague, you were pretty much a goner in the nineteenth century. Now, plague comes to India most likely from Hong Kong. It went to Hong Kong from certain parts of China. Plague has affected. Plague was in India even before 1894-1896. In the city I'm based in right now, Ahmedabad, there was a terrible plague outbreak in uh, the early part of the nineteenth century. So, plague was not entirely new. But what was new was the British response to plague when it hit Bombay city in you know, 1896. Uh, the British went, the British were very, very you know, keen to curtail the outbreak of plague and ensure that it does not reach Britain. And that's important. Why? Because Britain had a very strong collective memory of plague. London was you know, not only burned down by fire, but it was destroyed by plague in the 1660s. They also had the Black Death in the 14th century. So plague was something which was well entrenched in the collective memory of many Europeans. And they were hell-bent on saying that whatever happens, you know, plague should not reach Europe. And that is why they went in for the harshest possible containment measures uh, uh, ever tried out until then. And it is in that context that they kind of you know, created or invented a piece of legislation called the Epidemic Diseases Act of 1897. Right? And I'm sure many of you have heard of this act because it's the same act through which we are dealing with coronavirus today. Right? And so that's the most important legacy of the plague pandemic is the piece of legislation of health surveillance that comes into being. And it's a very draconian, especially at that time, it was very draconian surveillance law. A lot of opposition started happening to it. There was also an assassination of a British officer in Pune and so on. Now, uh, this is an example of you know, how they were uh, kind of uh, disinfecting people uh, back then. We saw similar images last year when you know migrant workers returning home were sort of cleansed by uh, officials. Again, nothing really to do with the disease. People really later realized that doing this, for example, would not really curtail plague and so on. But there's a lot of mystery because nobody really knew what plague was all about. Uh, an example of a temporary hospital, some of you might have seen scenes over the last one year due to COVID. This is again in Bombay. Uh, the interesting thing about plague is that it hit only few parts of India. And I'm bringing this up out here because one of the big questions in the coronavirus pandemic is why are some places of the world being more hit by coronavirus than others? And in the last one year, we created or rather invented a hypothesis which went something like this, 
that Indians have some sort of great natural immunity against this virus. And that is why the Americans and Germans and French were much more hit by the coronavirus than us. Right? Now, what the history tells us is that one has to be very careful in understanding regional variations in mortality because there's a lot about the pandemic that we still don't understand. Right? And the plague is a classic example because plague, as you'll see in this map, mainly hit the Gangetic sort of part. It hit Punjab, uh, modern day Uttar Pradesh, or what we then call as United Provinces, and places along the Western Ghats, which means many parts of India did not get too much of the plague. Now, back then, also public health officials patted themselves on the back saying, we have defeated the plague pandemic. But the fact is that it was later learned that plague is a disease transmitted from rodents who died of plague to humans via, this bat, via the, the bites of rat fleas. Right. And so this uncovering of the transmission mechanism happened roughly between 1900 and 1910. But for those 10 years, there was a lot of confusion as to why some places were more hit by plague than others. It turned out that you required only certain types of climates in which a certain type of a rat and a certain type of a rat flea could be found. Right. So in a sense, a lot of these blank spaces that you're seeing on this map got lucky. They could not actually, it was not conducive for plague to happen out. Right. And so that's why you know, uh, one has to be very careful when one looks at cross-regional patterns in, in, in any pandemic, because it's not certain as to why the pandemic disease should happen in a certain place. And with coronavirus also, we'll get to know much more in later years. An example of the plague inoculation, anti-plague inoculation certificate in Punjab, this is, I'm just showing this because, you know, vaccination is a hugely important subject right now. Uh, plague also went outside India. I said cholera hit Egypt a lot. Uh, plague also hit Egypt, but in the late, in the early 20th century, it really hit India and China the most. So India and China, the worst hit uh, uh, places, much of Southeast Asia as well, Vietnam, Indonesia, uh, and so on. It also reached Brazil. Uh, Brazil got one of their best doctors, uh, best scientists to Brazil, and he's considered the pioneer of their public health system out there. It did not really hit North America and Europe too much. Okay, So it kind of affected only one part of it. An example of an early PPE or a protective you know, equipment. Uh, plague really hit China big time in 1910-11. That was a pneumonic plague, so it transmitted even from human to human touch. Interestingly, the, the Chinese authorities shut down the transport network for migrant workers in order to curtail the pandemic. And just like India last year, they got a full-blown humanitarian crisis, which is a, another incident from the past to tell you, you know, that maybe it's not a great idea to shut down transport systems very abruptly, because then what you get is you know, people walking back home. And in that case, in January 1911, it was winter, and a lot of people died simply walking back home in the harsh winter in China back then. So how was plague eventually ended? A uh, lot of you know, people who were involved in this. Uh, I, I'm, you know, Savdri Bhai Pule, who is an important social reformer, activist, uh, uh, who actually died, succumbed to plague, and she started a clinic. Uh, and a lot of women, particularly in history, have played such a hugely important role in you know, providing care during pandemic, right? either in nursing, either at homes. And Savitri Bhai Fule is a classic example of a person who exemplifies that. Uh, Kita Sato and Yersin were the people who identified the bacteria. It's thanks to that that the vaccination efforts could start. And then William Liston, who was actually born in Sikandrabad in South India, um, officer of the Indian Medical Service, he's really the person who discovers this link between rodents and humans via rat fleas. And it's one of the great discoveries of you know, epidemiology. Uh, and so it's, it's a combination of so many people that we got a better understanding of the plague. Once they understood that plague was basically a rodent and, and rat flea uh, uh, based, rat proofing became a hugely important part of keeping plague at bay, which means suddenly you know, rat catchers got important. In central India, people also started keeping cats. So you had all sorts of you know, uh, interesting things happening in order to keep the rats out. But the plague pandemic most likely did not end so dramatically in the 1920s because of human ingenuity. It's quite likely that it passed out because of herd immunity against the disease, not so much by human beings, but by the rodents themselves. And so if the rodents did not die of plague, then the rat fleas would have no reason to bite human beings, or so that theory goes. But later on, between 1920 and 1960s, 1970s, there was the DDT spray, there was antibiotics, 
and we got a much better grip on play and so play progressively got phased out of the indian psyche and by the 1960s we had the last case of play so play is an interesting disease which goes out not only because of science and technology but also because of other reasons there was a slight scare in 1994 when there was a plague outbreak in surat but you know beyond that there's not been much which then brings me to influenza which is probably the closest you know in terms of uh, comparing with the covid a uh, pandemic uh, because it's a virus uh, and because you know it's a uh, uh, devastating toll across the world back then okay so this is the chart i showed you the first wave was very mild it happened in april you know june 1918 and the second wave was devastating the origins of this pandemic most likely lie in midwest america usa it is often called as the spanish flu but it's a misnomer people say you know that it was called spanish flu only because spain was neutral during world war 1 Uh, and that's why you know uh, uh, people Spain was reporting this disease. Other countries were not, and that's why it got called the Spanish flu. But most studies say that it's probably started in March or early in 1918 in USA, and kind of the second strain you know broke out in sometime in August 1918, maybe in France, at a, at a theater where a lot of about 100,000 you know American soldiers were densely packed in one area, and from there, as the soldiers started returning around the world. you know that's how the virus really spread that's one kind of model of how the virus spread so quickly around the world it went to virtually every part of the world the only places it did not reach were few islands which shut themselves to the outside world for at least two years right and so apart from that you know countries at from new zealand to places like alaska rural places in india rural india was particularly hit it is you know the worst pandemic on record uh, experienced by the whole world at one time and because it was in the context of world war 1 because uh, you know it happened so quickly the memory of it is also interestingly disappeared okay so india lost about 20 million people in this wave what we are saying is that in november 1918 about 200000 indians were dying every single day right so this is a very scary thing uh, you know in this covid wave the reported covid deaths are 4000 the actual deaths obviously would be much higher uh, but it's not going to be 200000 deaths a day right and so that's how terrifying it was india lost about 6% of its population which is a huge number and so this was a really terrifying uh, pandemic uh the first estimate of how many people died happened in february 1919 when the sanitary commissioner you know norman white placed the number at 6 million but my research and the research of others have now put it up from you know 6 million up to 20 million Uh, this is a map to show which parts of india were really hit it, it's in fact you know a chart taken from my phd thesis and it shows you basically that much of western and northern india were hit much more than southern and eastern india right so this is a map the yellow think of the yellow sh shades in this map as places which were really hit this is a map with data from 1918 but the map borders are you know 2001 uh, 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 so so don't go by the the political boundaries of this map just look at the the colors on this map now the question is why did so many people die why did 20 million indians die the interesting thing about the pandemic is that the pandemic went across india in the sense that the likelihood of contracting that influenza was uniform across india pretty much uniform but many more people died in western and northern india and the reason i give uh, in in my research is that india in 1918 was hit by two events not only the pandemic but few months before the pandemic india faced its third worst drought in recorded history and because of that drought food prices went through the roof and people simply did not have enough food or basic nutrition to counter influenza in places which had basic nutrition they could manage influenza much better in the sense you got the disease but it was not necessarily that fit it is only in those places which were really caught out by the drought that influenza and drought proved prove to be a very nasty combination which also tells you the importance of having adequate nutrition to tide through pandemics uh the economic impact of that was very severe i'm not going to spend too much time on this but i'll just point out that 1918 for instance is the worst economic year in history until this last year so you'll hear that you know india's gdp contracted by about 7% last year the worst for you know 30 40 years but there was a year which was even worse than that when it contracted by more than minus 10% and that uh, that was 1918 right and so 1918 was not only a demographic disaster it was also an economic disaster where prices also went through the roof 
inflation of 30%, GDP fall of 10, uh, more than 10%. So this is your classic supply side shock in the pandemic. Now, what did people do back then? It's very interesting to compare the public health protocols of those times with now. This is coming from the US, but you'll see that firstly, there's a mask. So this was also known as the mask disease. Uh, COVID is not the first time people started you know, wearing masks. But you'll see, you know, keep them out and clean, clean uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, sanitize, I mean, basically wash your hands and so on. Very similar to what we are seeing today. But you'll see that there's an added thing out here, which was not there in 2020, but is increasingly getting traction today. And that is ventilation. You know, if you've been following the coronavirus pandemic, you'll realize that the WHO has only recently put the fact that COVID is an airborne disease out there in the public domain. Otherwise, it was thought that it was you know, caused through droplets as you cough or sneeze, and that settles down. But when it's airborne, that means the classic six meter distance also might not help. It, uh, you know, it, it's just sort of, uh, it's going much further than that. And that is why ventilation you know, is now coming back into a huge kind of public health focus. But it's interesting that in 1918, ventilation was a huge part, right? So people would tell you, keep your windows open, it's important to get have ventilation. So while we didn't see ventilation as an important public health protocol last year, you'll see that this year it's now increasingly making a comeback. All right, so I'm gonna wrap up here and then take some questions. Uh, what is the legacy of the age of pandemics? And you know, what are some of the implications of it? The first is that the age of pandemics really created the world's modern medical system. Right, that it is precisely in order to counter cholera, to counter plague, that we got a lot of those discoveries, what we call as the bacteriological revolution of the late 19th century. It is that medical system which pretty much everyone in the world uses. Right? So even if you believe in Ayurveda uh, you know, uh, uh, treatments, the fact is that if you get COVID, you're more likely to go to a hospital, get yourself admitted, use medical systems which came about precisely because of the age of pandemics. Right? And so that's the biggest legacy. A lot of conferences, global conferences started from 1851 in order to curtail the cholera pandemic. And the culmination of those conferences in a way led to the formation of the World Health Organization in 1948. Right? So you'll see that many of the things we're seeing today, like the Epidemic Disease Act, like the Hafkin Institute, you know, like the WHO, all of them have their roots during the age of pandemics. What is its impact on India? I mentioned law, uh, vaccine development. You know, the, how, it's not a coincidence that India is, is, is a, you know, we say the vaccine manufacturer of the world and so on. The fact is that India had a very big early mover advantage in the world of man, vaccine manufacturing, precisely because India was hit so badly during the age of pandemics. Uh, I'll point about four things which are usually not well known. One is that a lot of urban development in India, urban planning, came about after the plague pandemic. Right? And so it's in response to that, the, the city improvement trust was set up. And so a lot of our development authorities today, development agencies and so on, urban development bodies, can trace their roots to systematic interventions which were done across many cities of India to ward off the plague pandemic. Many of you, I'm sure, had Amul butter, and Amul is nothing but a cooperative but it means that people come together and run an enterprise together. The cooperative movement in India really starts off in the 1900s because, and a lot of the people who were part of the cooperative movement were people who were involved in relief work during the plague pandemic. Just like we're seeing today, you know, in the last two months, how many people have done voluntary relief work, right? That's going to create a new cadre of leaders going forward, right? Because a lot of these people are now going to invest in organizational skills. Many of them will also go into politics and so on. So just like that, back then, a lot of people who are working on plague management went into the cooperative. The labor movement also in India kicked off after 1920 because so many people died in 1918. Right? And so the Royal Commission of Labor actually points out that it, the 1918 influenza pandemic was the tipping point because 6% of India's population just got wiped out. So what often happens in a pandemic is that if so many people die and so many laborers die, then the surviving labor actually Know, benefits because then they can have better bargaining power. So you'll see that wages in India started going up, trade unionism started going up. Basically, India's labor movement got a huge you know, uh, 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 uptick uh, thanks to the age of pandemics. And finally, the thing that we most know about this period, 
That is, if we'll go to our history textbooks, we are not going to read about pandemics, but we will read about India's freedom movement. But you'd be surprised to know how much of the freedom movement is back-ended with pandemics. Now, let me just give you three important dates in our history. One is 1857. How many of you know that 1857 uprising in India happened on the back of a major cholera outbreak that year? You know, so it was a cholera outbreak and then the uprising which happened. And there are studies which show that garrison towns which had more cholera outbreaks actually had more mutinies back then. Right. So you can't really, 1857, which is such an important date in Indian history, was, is also not divorced from pandemics. Then you have the creation and this you know, kind of a split of the Congress in the 1890s, 1900s. A lot of that is happening, again, the context of plague. And two leaders in Western India are very important, uh, Gokhale and Tilak, uh, you know, both Pune-based uh, leaders. Uh, and both of them uh, are hugely important in managing plague, uh, questioning the British government and so on. And in the city I'm based in right now, a person called Sardar Patel, who became India's first home minister. Uh, Sardar Patel's first public policy kind of role was as a sanitation committee member of the Ahmedabad municipality. And in 1917, when the plague hit, it was he who kind of went out and kind of, you know, got that experiencing of being a leader on the ground, trying to manage this disease. So Sardar Patel's Gokhale, Tilak, what I'm trying to say is that the pandemics themselves spawned a huge generation of leaders who then went on into politics later. So if 20 years down the line, you see many of the people that you've seen now working in voluntary relief, going into politics, you can say that you know, the pandemic was the tipping point that led many people out. So let me just wrap up. I've talked a little bit about you know, uh, uh, the origin myths. I've talked about migration. Uh, I'll just end with this thing that I call the stages of a pandemic. Right? When I look at this history, it seems to me that these pandemics go through four stages. First, there is denial. Second, there is confusion. Third, there is acceptance. And fourth, there is erasure, which means we forget. Right? And when I was writing this book last year, the thought I had was, you know, we've forgotten that entire epoch which happened back then. And, you know, in a way, we started off last year uh, in Jan and Feb with a lot of denial that you know, nothing can happen to Indians. Uh, this is not a big deal uh, and so on. Very soon in April last year, we had confusion. Then there was slow acceptance. But unfortunately, what we've seen in the last one year itself is a lot of erasure. You know, we, between September and February, it was almost like this pandemic is over. You know? And what pandemic history tells us is that you have to be very careful. You have to anticipate future waves and not forget. And what I would argue is that societies which erase more are more likely to be in denial mode the next time the wave of the pandemic comes around. And that is why history is so important. That is, as a society, we need the collective memory of these episodes, which will help us in the future so that we know that these are you know, serious things not to be taken lightly, and also know how to behave, also know, you know the basics of what to do, what not to do. For example, not shutting down the trains you know, with a four-hour notice period. These are important learnings that come from pandemics and important things. This has to be institutionalized so that they're not forgotten. So with that, I'm going to end. Uh, I run the social media handle called BizEconHis. If you're on Instagram or Twitter, you can, you can look at that. With that, I'll end and be happy to take questions. Thanks a lot, Chinmay. That was a really, um, it was a blast from the past, I think. Uh, everyone got an opportunity, I think, especially to reflect on uh, the lack of our collective memory on past pandemics and how much we could have learned from them. Uh, there are a lot of questions um, in the chat box. So I think we'll start. I'll start with a few. And uh, I'd like to encourage those who have questions to continue adding it to the Q&A box, please. And we'll share them with uh, Chinmay as we go ahead. So I think one, the first question that came in very early on uh, was uh, whether you feel that history taught in schools, colleges, universities should not be only political history, but that of pandemics, natural and man-made disasters over the last 200 years and how we've dealt with it. Yeah, just looking at this question. Yeah. So uh, yeah, thanks for this question, Vimala. Uh, Yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, yeah, I completely agree. Uh, I work in the field of business and economic history. I teach courses at IIM Ahmedabad on this. By the way, I also teach a course at IIM Ahmedabad called Pandemics. That's also an elective that I teach now. Uh, 
you know, our history is basically political history. We learn about kings and queens, and we learn about freedom movement. So it's it's almost entirely political history. So not just pandemics. We need to learn more, much more of economic history, for example, and so may, various other things. Uh, but especially big events. You know, if we think of wars as you know crazy events where a lot of people died, uh, you know, pandemics are definitely a class of events which falls under that category. And especially if 70 million people have died, you know, uh, if you're learning about World War One and World War Two, we ought to be learning about pandemics. And as I'm arguing, India was the most affected country in the age of pandemics. Right? And so that is why India definitely has to start incorporating this. Uh, already, certain things are changing. I think the government of Odisha has announced that they're going to change the curriculum to incorporate the studying of natural disasters, including cyclones, but also pandemics. Right? And so there's going to be curriculum change institute. And I think it's high time that you know curriculum in the pre-10th level kind of introduces the concept of disasters. It's very important to understand the, the, the equivalent here is that kids in Europe grow up knowing something about the Black Death. One third of European population was wiped out. Black Death as an event is kind of generally well known in Europe, right? Uh, that is not the case. And that's why I've written this book that the age of pandemics hopefully is remembered in India. Now, I'm also skeptical that this will happen. Uh, what I'm more hopeful is that this will happen if not in our general schools, in our medical schools. Because I think there's a huge value in the, our you know, doctors who are coming out who know the different sides of the episodes which happened in the past. For example, recommending a lockdown is the most obvious thing to do from an epidemiological point of view, right? But if you see, if you're a purely kind of, if you're a medical uh, school you know, student uh, and who is advising the government, you'll say, you know, shut down everything, right? Now you might come to a point where you have to kind of recommend that, but you also know from the past that when you do such things like the Chinese did in 1911, you might get a humanitarian crisis. So there has to be that sort of a planning or anticipation of what other things can happen. And that is why doctors, because obviously epidemiologists, doctors, deep scientists should be in the forefront in the, in the kind of you know, uh, 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 planning process, advising the government. But these people have to know what has also happened in the past. Right? So if not in school curricula, at least medical schools uh, you know, should hopefully incorporate uh, electives or, or compulsory uh, components on the history of medicine, history of pandemics uh, in, in, in that. So that's, that's what I'm pushing for. Uh, and that is why events like this in particular are so important, uh, you know, uh, of curating science and different aspects of science uh, and so on. I think, uh, thanks, Pinma. I think the next question is an interesting one and I have a little add on to that. So Rudra has asked, but given the documentation of any infectious disease or pandemics is an important criteria, important factor in helping controlling the spread. So one was of course, how was this documentation done in the 18th and 19th century? And I think the question we'd all like to know is whether the documentation we are doing today is enough for historians in the future to be able to, you know, look back uh, at what is happening today. Yeah, so both, both great questions. Uh, I don't know much of pandemics in the 18th century for the simple reason that the documentation is very sparse at this point, right? So I'll be, but I'll, I'll be, I'll tell you, I mean, it's not like, you know, over the years, more pandemics are happening. It's very, it's a very kind of a random event, right? In the sense that there were, there were really no documented pandemics in the 18th century. Right. It's really, as I'm saying, that's why I'm calling this book The Age of Pandemics, 1817 to 1920. Right. Uh, is, it, is it possible that if in the future people find you know, evidence uh, of a particular disease which, which was very rampant in the 18th century, that we'll have to say that, oh, no, there was a pandemic also in the 18th century? Possible, but very unlikely. Because as you know, it has to affect, I mean, uh, the definition is that it has to affect a fair, fairly large kind of space, which means some documents must have survived. Right. And so that is why, as of now, I would say it's very unlikely that the 18th century had a pandemic uh, and the documentation in general was you know, uh, fairly poor. Now, as we come to the 19th century, okay, we have much more documentation. We have much more traveler records. Uh, uh, we do have fewer first-person accounts, interesting. I think that's because if, you know, I, I found it really tough. In my book, I do have first-person accounts, but I found it very tough to find them. You know, so many of these people who lived through the age of pandemics, it was for them... Kind of, uh, kind of a routine event because it was so widely prevalent for so long. So they did not necessarily see it as an completely you know, outsized event like we are seeing it today. It's unlikely that any of us will forget COVID in our lifetimes. 
right? But it's quite likely that people who lived in a in the age of pandemics thought that the flu of 1918 was bad, but you know they had just uh, they had just gone through cholera, plague, and so on. So it was not it was not completely out of the blue like how we are facing it. Uh, as a result, first person accounts are relatively rare back then, right? And we have much more first person accounts today than. That. But as the British kind of get a toehold in in the country in the 19th century, official documentation increases. And the official documentation actually is in response to the cholera pandemic. For example, our death registration system in India starts off in the 1860s because the British want to know how many of the soldiers are dying due to especially cholera, but other diseases. And from 1870s, it's not just the soldiers, but the general population. And that's when the mortality statistical database of India starts. Now, in this book, I also use other stuff. You know, I. Uh, I was at the uh, Kolkata South Park Street Cemetery just a few days before the national lockdown last year. And it just uh, uh, kind of coincidence that I picked up a book from the counter, which has all the burial records, right? Uh, and I got this digitized. And if you see my working paper, there's a chart. That's a rare document because that shows you the timeline of deaths from about 1800 to about 1850s. And not surprisingly, 1817 is the year where it spikes up, right? And so these are kind of ways in which one can make inferences of the years in which the epidemics were very large. So burial records, uh, uh, official reports written of those times, letters, of course, and so on. Uh, but the documentation, I would say, from 1870 to 1920, 1930 is quite good because the British were forced by the Indian you know, people to have actually official documentation. They came out with these annual reports on plague. There were annual reports on vaccination, for example. So the documentation kind of progressively got better. In fact, it'll be... I would say that on some aspects, the documentation and release was better in 1980, 19 than even today. For example, today, for example, I don't have the data on excess mortality. I cannot say how many people have died in COVID in, in wave one and wave two because no government has yet released the all-cause mortality statistics. Back then, it was released at a shorter time frame. So you could work out how many people had died with this excess mortality method in 1980 you know, uh, or 1920 at a shorter time lag than what you can do, right? So that's, that's it's, a, it's a crazy, you would think that data today is much better, but on some counts, our data release is actually slow, right? So that's, that's how I see documentation, but documentation was very important because I tell you, plague documentation initially, they dismissed this rat, rat flea human transmission theory. So the annual reports, when you look at it now, were actually wrong, but it's because of those annual reports People like Liston looked at them. They looked at what, why is it that they dismissed this hypothesis? Then they worked it out. And by 10 years later, you know, the whole opinion had changed. So documentation is very, observation, data collection is very important. I don't think any pandemic or disease has been ended without systematic observation, collection of cases, deaths, you know, statistics, uh, and so on. Uh, now to your point on documentation, are we doing enough to document this today? I think we need to have a nonpartisan government report, just like we had those you know, reports on plague. Uh, it has to be nonpartisan, which basically goes into all aspects of the current pandemic. That's the minimum. Because if we think, oh, nothing, you know, this memory can never fade, I'm sorry, it will fade. So much of our thing collect is, is digital right now uh, that, you know, if uh, something changes 40 years later, you know, all this digital memory can be erased uh, uh, very, very quickly. So we have to do much more. Uh, and that's why building onto the first question, you know, in, incorporating it in curricula, uh, incorporating in as, as an official government report on this. Books have to be written on this. I mean, this book which I've written is the first book which covers these three deadly pandemics, uh, especially for India. You know, I mean, there are medical historians who have written on specific diseases. Uh, but for example, the chapter in my book on influenza, I would say is the most comprehensive account of the greatest demographic shock ever hitting India. Right? And it, this was written in 2020, 102 years after this. Right? And so we need obviously many books written on COVID in the coming years. Thanks, Um, I think there's a question from another historian in the house. Uh, John Matthew has a question. So he uh, says that David Arnold has likened, who also gave a talk uh, as part of the series, has likened the great influenza in India to a sort of curious incident of the dog in the nighttime where the fact that the dog did not bark and Laura Spinney who's also written of course about the influenza suggests that the pandemic may well have fueled much of the freedom movement at that time given what you've sort of spoken about in your lecture would you be more partial to the latter position the way I look at this it's, it's an excellent question that for those who, who, who don't know this you know the difference in views 
basically, David Arnold saying, look, influenza killed a lot of people, but it did not seem to have that much of an effect in the language of the politician of those times. Just to put it in context, a few months after influenza killed, we're saying 20 million people. At that time, people thought 6 million, let's work with the 6 million figure, 6 million people at that time. In April 1919, you had the Jalian Albaq tragedy. Right? Now, all of us know about the Jalian Albaq tragedy, even today. Right? And that killed a few hundred people. Now, why is it that we remember that, but not the 6 million or 20 million people who died just in a few months before that? Right? Uh, and people used, the, the Indian freedom movement used the Jalian Albaq tragedy much more than the pandemic. Right? So rather than saying, how could 6 million Indian people die? The, the freedom movement was hugely propelled by, by you know, particular acts of violence by the British. Right? Because why they're clearly identifiable enemy and so on. So uh, David Allen has an interesting point that it did not seem to have much of a political effect. And Laura Spinney is you know, pointing out that you know, it had a big effect on the freedom movement and so on. Uh, and again, if you look at the writings of those times, I am more partial to the David Arnold view. That is, politicians' language rarely use the influenza pandemic as the starting point. Right? But I would argue that that's not the whole picture. The fact that 6% of the population you know, was wiped out fundamentally activated India's labor movement. And it is a lot of our politicians then in the 1920s, 30s started emerging from that labor movement. So this is, in a way, the, the link between the freedom movement and the influence pandemic. It's not in the political vocabulary. You know, nobody in the, by the 1930s, no politician was saying, you know, you killed 6 million Indians in the influenza pandemic, and that is why we are against you. No, so that's the David Arnold. So David Arnold is right there, right? But it's precisely because of that pandemic that so many people died, that labor got much more of a voice, and that voice started getting translated into politics. So it's this indirect channel through which the pandemic had a, a huge impact on the freedom. So, so in a way, my view is, you know, in between the David Arnold and Laura Spinney. Uh, I think there's another interesting question, which as a sort of business historian might be very uh, cool for you to talk about. Gayatri said that she's been intrigued by the link between pandemic relief and the rise of cooperatives, and was wondering if you could say a bit more about that. Yeah, so what is pandemic relief? You know, I mean, it's uh, for about 10 years, uh, my estimates about 30 million people were being evacuated for a few months on a daily basis from their houses, right? Every year. What I mean is, you know, after doing all this disinfectants and uh, cleaning, washing your hands, all of, all, of, all of those things, they realize that that does not help solve plague. Okay, they realize that ancient wisdom, traditional Indian knowledge was that when you see rats die, it is a sign of plague, you, you escape from them, which means you don't stay the night in that place. It's a very interesting piece of observation. It was rooted in science in a sense that science later kind of showed that this was a right logic, but nobody really knew why this was happening. So the idea is if you see rats dying around, don't spend the night at your hut, spend, spend it somewhere out, and then you come during the day, you can you know, work your fields, but don't spend the night. So there was something about the night where people thought that plague was happening. And so this is what became a strategy. So the British very quickly realized that actually what this traditional Indian wisdom made a lot of sense. That plague incidents and deaths was lower in places where villages were basically camping outside. Not just villages, small towns. You have traveler records of those times where entire, like Bijapur, for example, in, in Karnataka, you know, entire towns were camping outside. Now that required a lot of, you know, organizational skills. How do you take an entire village to camp out day in and day out for a few months of the year? Plague was seasonal, so plague would come in a few months of the year. And this was the way for about 10 years Indians were doing this. And you have first-person accounts of this. You know, so uh, for, this was a hugely important push to the cooperative movement because those organizational skills were very important. So when people, you know, after this whole thing uh, got over, a lot of the cooperatives, if you see the first leaders of the corporate movement, they were people often people coming from this plague relief measures. And plague relief was what basically evacuation uh, for that particular you know, critical junction. Uh, this kind of stopped later on when people got you know, rat catchers and when this, when this link was established. If you're wondering why this nighttime thing, it turns out that the rat flea is, is, is sensitive to uh, light and a lot of climatic factors. And so the, the, the rat flea bites happen mostly in the night. Right? And so that's the interesting scientific aspect of it. That is, it's you're more likely to get plague during the night. That is the first contact uh, rather than during the day. 
So it's interesting because there was kind of observational wisdom, right? Not scientific wisdom in in a very concrete sense, but it was kind of justified later on uh, 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 by them. But I hope that kind of answers the point how the cooperative movement was linked uh, with. with Okay, since we are already spilling over for time, I think we will just um, cap it with one more question so Chinmay can have a break between our lecture series and as you all know, we'll be having a tutorial for young adults in uh, after this lecture. So those of you can whose questions may not have been answered here can of course uh, continue to discuss this with Chinmay over there. I think the last question we can take is probably because he's, uh, he's thank you for the great lecture and he's he, I think he would like you to elaborate a bit on how we've seen even during past pandemics that there have been there has been some form of um, distrust or against particular communities, and this is something that we've seen happen again. And what are the are sort of lessons from history in this case? Right. So, uh, you know, so this aspects of that uh, I mentioned the book, for example, plague in Europe. You know, historically, huge discrimination against the Jews. The Jews were often blamed as pandemic carriers, right? Super spreaders. That was not the word used, but but uh, 14th century uh, uh, black death. You know, a lot of lot of violence against Jews across Europe back then. Uh, in fact, there's a research paper which links that and what happened in the 20th century. You know, uh, saying that those same places harbored those sentiments for so many centuries and so on. Uh, so definitely that's one community which got, you know, a, a lot of the attack during pandemics. In India, you know, I mean, I quote Ambedkar, uh, who pointed out as late as 1940s, uh, you know, he was pointing out that, you know, uh, uh, a person from uh, the then, then called untouchable community uh, was literally burned, I mean, put to the stake uh, because the person was suspected to bring cholera to the village, right? So it's, so marginalized social groups in India were definitely targeted uh, as the kind of uh, hard bringers of disease. I think if you live in any of these apartment complexes, you'll see what happened last year with domestic health. At some point, this whole thing changed. Oh, maybe the domestic health are spreading the disease. You know, we have to take a distance. You know, that kind of a, uh, idea. So marginalized social groups, lower classes, have definitely been at the receiving end of uh, discrimination. Not if there are specific communities in, in, in the past uh, in, in India. Uh, as I said, uh, this was one. I mean, Ambedkar also points out that in the 1918 pandemic, uh, he says one of the charges against the doctors was that unfair, or you can say preferential treatment in hospitals. So a lot of people did not get access uh, in hospitals. I just read an article, I don't know how true this is, on Bangalore just a few days back, of uh, people denied vaccines because of their caste. Now, I don't know how true this is, but you know, there's a whole news, news report on this. Uh, but if true, very sad, and it kind of tells you that, you know, uh, on that part, maybe not much has uh, changed. Uh, but yeah, so discrimination, uh, rumor mongering, you know, uh, hugely this thing. Uh, but a lot of this was also against the British. So the Indi so during playing, the Indians also thought that, you know, this the British are doing this deliberately, you know, and so there's a lot of thing in Punjab. So the same, it's interesting, this, this idea that the British are poisoning our wells, you know, this idea, of, not the British, but poisoning wells as a rumor mongering, was heard in the 14th century Black Death against Jews and in the late 19th century plague pandemic in India uh, against the British in, in Punjab. So the Punjab uh, people were saying, you know, the British are poisoning our wells and, and uh, so a lot of rumor moment. David Arnold, Arnold has written a lot on this, you know, about, uh, I think David Arnold's work is probably the best to really understand uh, the extent of discrimination, but it kind of cut all ways. The Indians were blaming the British, the British were blaming Indians among different groups. Why ultimately, why is this you know, blame game happening is because you don't, don't really know how it started, right? It's not something like a war where, you know, this person has started the war. It's some kind of a invisible, you know, uh, entity uh, and uh, it heightens your anxieties. And so you're looking for something to blame, right? So it could be another country, it could be another community, it could be just, just about anything. And the learning, of course, from this is that one has to be sensible and you know really understand. Yes, of course, if people are deliberately spreading disease, you know, then you can blame that person. Uh, but beyond that, you know, in, infectious diseases uh, do not have to have a deliberate focus. So one has to be sensitive. Okay. Thank I'll, just go you, very, uh, I'll just go very quickly yeah. on two points. I think both of them are, you know, how did these pandemics end? Uh, I, I mentioned cholera was prevention and cure. Plague was more of herd immunity among rodents. On the flu, how did the flu of 1918 go up? Various theories on this. 
one is of course that so many people died right that there's not much more for the virus to do in the sense in fact it's not very good for the virus if a lot of people dies right? because it, as a person dies typically the virus kind of ends with it it does not have more bodies to latch on to and so that's one theory that if if a lot of people go out actually very quickly then that's a quick closure to the pandemic right so nobody wants to wants wants that as a as a means to end a pandemic but that's uh, that's so you're saying the virus kind of fizzles out precisely because of this. was it because the virus itself mutated into lesser kind of dangerous strains that's a possibility but one on which i am i i would place less weight on right? but there are papers which kind of uh, uh, look at this uh, strand uh, as well uh, and the, I, i'll just tell you the paper which look at india on this argues this using death data and they show that you know as it go, as you go away from bombay into the east few people died and so the argument is that the virus might have mutated into lesser dangerous forms as it went out uh, the problem is that when you look at case data all of india was infected and as i'm arguing it's the case mortality ratio which varied across india not the case rate itself and and so one has to look at why so it's not so that's why i place less weight on the virus mutation across india rather than you know the fact that uh, uh, the people to, to take the analogy this pandemic was there everywhere but in some places where oxygen was really in in sharp shortage unnecessarily a lot more people died who could have potentially been saved right and that's what i'm saying in 1918 a lot of people were so malnourished that they could have survived but they they, they were they were better nourished in 1918 in southern and eastern india because there's no drought there uh, than in western and north india so that, these are this some of the ways i'm seeing you know how uh, the pandemic ended but it and ended in india there were two distinct waves but in other places there were sometimes three waves right so the waves kind of kept on coming uh, and arguably in india we got only two waves because it went so it went through so much of the population my estimates are about 40 to 60% of the population all india population contracted the flu right so pretty much you, it's it's tilting towards the point of herd immunity right so so it's quite possible it's a combination of many of these reasons herd immunity uh, virus fizzles out uh, or you know just just or mutation right i mean these are the kind of explanation but i'm tilting towards the herd immunity angle on that all right um uh, thank you chinmay uh, i think we can um, it's 7:45 so we'll wrap sure. up the uh, lecture today um, so just to remind everyone the recording of all our lectures are available on our youtube channel so in case you missed up the list events or you'd like to come back and listen to chinmay again do check it out on our youtube channel and if you've enjoyed this lecture and you would like to explore more especially about the plague in india you can check out an exhibit by christos linteris called controlling the plague in british india which has images from some of the scenes that chinmay has described today as well as drawing the bombay plague by ranjit kandal gaonkar um, do go in and explore it it has uh, scenes from uh, the development of the plague vaccine by hafkin which uh, again chinmay has talked about today so there'll be several interesting parallels which i think uh, you would enjoy exploring and also do take a look at the exhibit mapping cholera a tale of two cities by investigative journalist sonia shah and dan mccary which looks at cholera outbreaks uh, in uh, in the 1800s in new york as well uh, and given that we've spoken so much about david arnold's work please do consider watching a recording of his lecture science and seeing the visual technology of contagion in 19th century india that was given earlier on in our public lecture series and that's available on youtube as well i'd again like to encourage everyone to please fill out the feedback form uh, the link is in the chat do tell us how you enjoyed the session and what more we could do to bring you better and better public engagement programs going forward and uh, so With that, I'd like to close today and thank Chinmay for a wonderful lecture. Thank you so much, Chinmay. It was a pleasure having you here, and I'd like to thank everyone who's joined us today evening. Uh, please do stay safe, and uh, we hope to see you tomorrow for tomorrow's lecture as well. Good night, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.